How are you tonight? You ready for tonight? So there's two things I want you to get out of tonight, which is consistent, right? I want you to have a profound experience of God, and I want you to get, live your greatest possible life. And tonight we're going to talk about self-awareness. Yay! How many of you have just wanted not to know more about yourself? Anybody? How many of you have ever wanted other people not to know more about you? Like, so, so part of our spiritual journey is making peace with self-awareness, right? Because for most of us, it's not always the easiest thing to reveal ourselves. True? And some of us are trying really hard only to reveal some of ourselves, like all the good parts, right? Like we wash our car on our first date and we put on clean clothes and we do all the things and then after a while it's like, ah, right? So tonight is all about getting real and getting real in a very spiritual way that makes a difference in your life. So are you ready? Okay, our opening statement tonight, and this is a fun one. You ready? Shoot it up there. Ready? I am whole. I am real. I am fabulous. Together? I am whole. I am real. I am fabulous. One more time like we actually mean it. Together? I am whole. I am real. I am fabulous. One more time just because it's fun. I am whole. I am real. I am fabulous. Look at this. Some of you know that last Saturday I had the honor of performing my daughter's wedding. Some of you have asked to see pictures. So um, let's shoot. Here, there's the bride and groom. They got married up at um, Mormon Lake at the lodge there. We rented out the whole lodge for their wedding. There, there they are kissing. And that's their dog. That's me performing the ceremony outside. I think there's one more. Oh, that's father-daughter first dance. And uh, people wanted to know if I cried during the ceremony only twice. <laughs> but my voice cracked multiple times. So I just wanted to share that with you. It was absolutely a perfect weekend. And uh, I didn't know if I could do it, but my baby girl is now married, and God bless me. Here we go, right? Take a deep breath. And feel the glory of God that's within you and all around you. That you were created in the image and likeness of God. You were created whole and complete and lacking in nothing. And the deeper we go into ourselves, the deeper we go into our spiritual life, the deeper we go into God. the more we can see ourselves the way God sees us. The more we can see ourselves as the radiant center of God's good. That you are whole and complete because you were created in the image and likeness of God. And as we live our spiritual life, over and over again, we let go of all of the old illusions, all of the old beliefs, all of the old misconceptions. And we begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. The radiant expression of the divine. that you were not broken, you were not less than. You are the living expression of God. You are the living expression of all that God is. Take a deep breath. and breathe in the perfection of spirit.
Breathe in the perfection of who you are. For you are God's light and God's joy, God's peace and God's power. You are God's radiant spirit sent into the world to be the living expression of God. You are spirit expressing. You are the divine made manifest. You are the best that God is. You are God's light and love and joy and peace made real. And from the moment you were created, God has loved you. God has celebrated your presence. The living manifestation of God's goodness. So take another deep breath. And see how much of your goodness, the goodness of God, can you see in yourself? Can you acknowledge? Can you celebrate? How much of the divine are you willing to claim as you? Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You are God's spirit. You are God's light and love and peace. And tonight we claim it. We live it. We know the truth of who we are. And we celebrate the light that we have come to be in the world. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For all that is going on in the world, we ask for prayers and love and peace. For the healing of our planet, we give thanks. For the truth that love is always greater, that there's always enough to go around, and that each and every man, woman, and child was created in the image and likeness of God, we give thanks. And so it is. Amen. Take off the mask, be real. That was great. Wasn't that great? Sally Joe, fabulous. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you. All right, you ready for me? So my question for you tonight is, what is your level of self-awareness? Is your self-awareness expanding or contracting? Do you know more about yourself today than you did five years ago? Do you know more than you did last week? And is it easier for you to share that with others? Right? Because I want to talk today, tonight about getting real. And I, I was going through Facebook, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and there was just this one thing that just said, Get real. And, and I think that many of us have probably used that as a derogatory statement about somebody else. Have you ever said that to somebody else? Not anybody in this room would never do that. Of course not. I'm sorry. I don't even want to imply that we would ever be derogatory about anybody else. But sometimes, you know, guys, you hear things, or ladies, you hear things, and, you know, you hear people say, oh, you know, I wish they'd get real. I wish they would just get more real. 
Right? Have you ever been with somebody, you know, as a friend or family member, and it's just like, hello? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, it's like, is anybody in there? Right? Is there anything real in this conversation? Is there anything meaningful in like, hello, remember that, what was that, McFly? Hello, McFly? <laughs> yes, Back to the Future, I'm sorry. 80s movie references don't always go over when, when they're now 35 years old, you know, so. <laughs> right? So. <laughs> sorry, I'm back. So the question is, in your own life, is being real becoming easier and easier? Or is it something you still dance with? Usually what happens when we want somebody else to be real is that we want them to relate to us from our dominant way of being in the world. Like, there's really four ways that we tend to show up in the world. Mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, right? So when somebody's not being real in our world, right, and, and we, we tend to be mental or, or that's our dominant way of showing up, then we get frustrated when it doesn't look like they're thinking things through. Like if they don't have a plan and if they don't have three plans beyond the plan, right, if they're not using their mind to figure out how life's supposed to work, we want to tell them, oh, get real. Like because you have to figure these things out. Right? Because we are mentally dominant way of being in the world, and so we want to think everything through before we do it. And when people don't want to think everything through, we think they're being silly or naive or inappropriate or immature because they're not being the way we are. But if we're emotionally focused, then we want to tell people to get real when they don't know what they're feeling. We want to tell them to get real because we're having feelings here and you're not willing to acknowledge your feelings and I want you to get real because I want to know what your feelings are because I want us to roll around in our feelings and let's talk about our feelings and let's share our feelings and we can have so many feelings right in this moment and let's, let's get real with our feelings, right? Yes, right? And sometimes if we're physically focused, right, we want to tell people to get real when they're not paying attention to the world when it doesn't look like they're making good financial choices or physical choices or, or safety choices or taking care of their body, we want to just shout at them, get real. And sometimes it's even as a spiritual being, we get frustrated that we want to relate to people from the spiritual dimension, from, from our inner self, from our, our deeper connection to God, from our, our sacred self. And when people don't relate to us that way, we want to tell them to get real. And so one of the places I want you to look at in your own life is where are you being frustrated by other people not being real? Right? Because that kind of reveals to us what our dominant way of showing up in life is. Are we mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual? And, and knowing where we're frustrated sometimes reveals to us the thing that is the most important. Right? So if we're upset that somebody's not sharing their feelings or they're not thinking things through or they're not acknowledging the physical limitations or they're not really celebrating their, their own spirit or my spirit or their spirit, it's helpful to know, oh, that really is important to me. That's really how I organize information. That's really how I do life. And I want people in my life who can relate to me from my dominant way of being in the world. And the problem is, is that we think that our dominant way of being in the world is, of course, the best way. True? Like, if you're mental, man, it just, it's like, what a bunch of idiots. Like, nobody thinks anything through. Nobody builds a plan. What, what, what a bunch of idiots. Or if you're emotional, you, you really think that everybody is backwards if they don't know what they're feeling. Like, to the nth degree all the time. And right, can emote it at, at various levels, right? And yet, what does that really mean to get real? Because for some of us, we can get real at all four of those levels, and yet we're still struggling with who we are. 
like the biggest part of our life and our spiritual journey, if you will, is really self-discovery. And are we beginning to know ourselves and experience more and more of who we are? Because we're either moving to, into a place of becoming more and more consciously aware of who we are, or we're staying unconscious. And sometimes unconscious doesn't look bad. Right? It just doesn't look bad. I just don't want to know. I don't want to see it. Thank you very much. But I've looked, and I'm not that deep, and I don't really want to be that deep. And thank you very much. So let's just move on, right? This is who I am. I only hang out at this level, right? And there's not a problem. This is where I hang out. And, and yet, the reality is, until we start going deeper into self-awareness, we don't really get to the place where we discover God. Like for most of us, when we're just living at the surface level of our personality, we can see our quirks and our insecurities and our crankiness, and we can see all that. But it's not really at the surface that we really come to know ourselves created in the image and likeness of God. That really begins to happen when we're willing to be more and more self-aware at deeper and deeper levels of self. But the problem is... To become aware of that, you have to become aware of everything. How many of you would just like to know all the good things about you? I would. I, I absolutely would. Like, I, w I would love it if I could just see all the happy, good, wonderful, productive parts of me. But part of becoming self-aware is that you get to see it all, right? And, and for some of us, this only gives us more ammunition to beat ourselves up. How many of you know that you can beat yourself up rel relatively quickly, right? So it's like if, if you know that you're kind of prone to beating yourself up, self-awareness is a scary thing because it just gives you more ammunition just to see what a rotten, terrible person you are. But the idea of self-awareness really is so that we can really expand so that we can get down to our core, we can get down to our essence, we can get, begin to experience ourselves in the way and in the image and likeness of God. But then how do we do that? And I'd like to say tonight that self-awareness without more self-love is painful. Right? So if you become more self-aware without more self-love, you just beat yourself up more. That self-awareness really requires more self-love. So as you get to see all the weird, cranky things you do, your heart has to begin to open. And for most of us, we're more willing to put ourselves down than to be a loving presence for ourselves. So tonight what I want to do is I want to give you um, four ideas on this idea of getting real. And the first one is kind of the not. It's, this is not the way to go, right? So be, getting real is not permission to take somebody else's inventory. True? Like sometimes we hear people say, well, I just got to get real with you. I got to tell you the truth. I got to tell you what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking. And then they think because they're getting real, they have permission just to unload about everything they don't like about you. That in my mind is not getting real. That's just kind of blasting somebody. And, and it's not really helpful that, that it's really, you don't get to take somebody else's inventory until you can really love them the way they are. Can I say that again? Is that you don't really get to take somebody else's inventory until you love them the way they are. Because when you think the way they are is wrong, we've missed the point. Now, being the way they are may not always be helpful to, their, to themselves. It may not be helpful to anybody else. But what I want you to see is that our job is to love people at the level that God loves us. True? Our, that's our job. Our job is to love each other at the level that God loves us. So if I can't say what I need to say to you in a way with my heart open, it's not mine to say. Now you say, well, Richard... If they're infringing on my boundaries, it is absolutely my thing to say. <laughs> right? 
And at some level, that's true. I mean, you have a right to be a stand for yourself. But if you think you're there to tell them the truth to help them and you can't do it with an open heart, it's not going to help. How many of you can think of somebody in your life who you know they said they were trying to say it in love, but you just didn't feel any love in it at all? It just wasn't helpful. It just absolutely was not helpful. So getting real with someone is really, if you're going to try to help somebody with their issue, right, your heart needs to be open. Or it just sounds like more criticism. Right? And being real does not mean that you get to be the police chief for the universe. Right? That we get real takes us to a deeper place of love. Two. No one can be real with you at a deeper level than they're being real with themselves. Is that true? So you may want somebody to get real, and they're not that real with themselves. And just because you go and hang out at the deep end of the pool doesn't mean that everybody needs to go hang out at the deep end of the pool. God gives us all all the time we want to do our spiritual work. True? Because God's got infinite, right? Because God knows we're going to all get there eventually. All the little ducks are going to get home, right? So God simply does not care how long you spend on the first step. You get to spend as much time on the first step as you want to take on this first step, but there is going to be a time when you realize that the first step may not be the best step, where your soul may actually become curious about what it's like to swim in the deeper waters. But if the only way you know yourself is on the first step, there's no way you're going to know how to be more honest or more vulnerable or more transparent than other than the way you know yourself, and the only way you've known yourself is on the first step. So you can't be more honest, more real than how you know yourself. Can everybody think of one person in their life that they've wanted to be more real, and you realize that you've really been asking them to do that which they haven't done for themselves yet. They just haven't done it for themselves. And so you keep getting frustrated and annoyed and upset that they're not going deeper. The truth is they're not going deeper. And you can have an attitude, you can can feel victimized by it, you can feel upset by it, you can have all these things, but they just haven't left the first step yet. And you can get really egotistical. Look, I'm down in the deep end, and I am I know this stroke, and I know that stroke, and I can swim all the way to the bottom, and look at me. And, and why don't you come out? It's more fun out here. And they're not like, nah, my hair will get wet. <laughs> oh, you know? Like, I, I just can't do that, right? I don't go deep. I just stay right here on the first step. So one of the things I'm going to invite you to look at about getting real is the person who's living on the first step, they're being as real as they know how to be in that moment. And if you're so deep, then get over yourself. Right? And just let them be on the first step. Tell yourself the truth. That's where they are. And God has given them permission to be there as long as they want because God knows that everybody is eventually going to get home. But it's not our timetable. It's theirs. Now, number three. Number three is where it really gets fun. Everybody knows the the idea on the, 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 the Greek temple of Delphi. It says, know thyself, right? So what's the number one thing that keeps us from knowing ourselves? Anybody want to take a shot? What's the thing that keeps you from knowing yourself? Anybody? Fear? Okay. I'm going to be more specific. Right? And I'm going to suggest tonight it's shame. That that shame is the number one thing that keeps us from knowing and expressing ourselves to others. And I can prove it. It's actually scriptural. Right? Genesis. We're going all the way back. The old book. 
Genesis 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate it. And she also gave it to her husband, and he ate it. And they both uh, eyes were open, and then they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden on a cool day. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from his presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, I love this one. It wasn't me, it was the woman. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> throw her under the bus, right? Right? He, the woman, it was the woman that thou gavest me, and she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, For thou, what, what hast thou done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, right? So who does she throw under the bus? It wasn't me, right? It was the serpent, right? And then the Lord begins to talk to them. And because they've eaten from this fruit, there was two things that, the, two consequences of that. And I want you to hear these, right? To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply the pain of childbearing. And to the man, verse 19, he says, from the sweat of your face shall you make your daily bread. And, and the reason I think this is important is that when we are in our shame, when we are embarrassed who we are, everything in life gets more painful. When we're embarrassed or ashamed of who we are, everything in life gets harder. And what I want you to see is the place where most of us are in this rub of being more real, because if we told ourselves the truth, there's a level of shame that keeps us from self-discovery and self-expression. And the only way that we can really move forward is more unconditional love. Because in the presence of enough unconditional love, there's no room for shame. And so where we stop in, in our realness, where we stop in our own transparency, is because we don't feel we have enough love to be the way we are. So how do we overcome that? Well, one of the things Greg Bear talks about, who was just here a couple months ago, last month, he talks about the fact that we all need three or four people in our life who unconditionally love us, who we can be absolutely transparent with. They can know us warts and all and love us just the way we are. Because in the presence of that much love, we begin to learn to how to love ourselves. And so every time we're not being real, every time we're not taking our next step into discovering who we are, it's literally because we don't have enough love. And yet I'd like to suggest to you tonight that I believe that we all have people in our life who actually love us in a greater way than we even understand. But because we don't reveal ourselves totally and completely to them, we ne never get to feel unconditionally loved. So how do we take our next step? For me, the thing that we want to do the least is the thing that is the most helpful. See, if you were perfect, would unconditional love be a big deal? And I'd suggest no, right? If you were a per who couldn't love a perfect person? Right? I mean, any of us could love a, if you were a perfect person, I mean, that's what we're all looking for. We're all looking for a perfect person to love because they're the easiest person to love. Right? But the problem is we're all semi-imperfect. We're all created in the image like this of God, whole and complete, and yet we're weird. <laughs> right? We're a little, right? There's a little aspect of us that's just odd. Right? 
And then we get to practice unconditional love. And the way that we all move forward is you actually share with the person who loves you the most the part of you that's odd, and you see if they can love you there. Now, you might not share the most odd thing in the first 10 minutes of meeting someone. You might kind of want to work up to your oddest thing about you, right? <laughs> but you actually begin to get real with people and see if they can love you there. What I would caution you not to do is to share to the people in your life who you know are not very good at loving you. See, usually what happens is we go to all the people that we usually go to who aren't very good at it, and we get disappointed that they didn't do it right. I'm actually inviting you tonight to go to the people in your life who you know are good at it, let them love you right there, and see what happens. Well, it won't really count because they love me with anything. That's the point. I mean, that's the point, right? They love you with anything. That's the definition of unconditional love. You're not trying to get people converted to loving you, right? You're not trying to get people who have a really hard time loving you finally to be in your camp. You're actually letting the people who it's easy for them to love you to love you so that you get to learn to love yourself more. So here's where I'm going tonight. You ready for this, right? Here's your homework. I absolutely believe for any of us to feel unconditionally loved, we need to be more real, not with everybody, but with the two or three people that most people have in their life who love them in a way that's more significant than we believe. And to actually begin to share your, what you see as your imperfections, you sh see as your oddness, you see as, ooh, I dropped the ball there. You see as your mistakes and see if they can love you right there so that we get to build a world where we are no longer hiding behind the tree from God and the people around us. See, we've done shame long enough. And some of us are still standing there with the fig leaf tied around us, hiding behind the tree because we're afraid to be vulnerable. We're afraid to be real. We're afraid to be transparent. And tonight I'd like to suggest that the only way that we can really heal our planet at the next level is to tell the truth. Not just about your perfection and your holiness and your sacredness, but have people in your life that you can tell the truth to and let them love you right there. Because as the more we get comfortable with getting real with the people we have a high degree of belief are going to love us, the more it gets easy to be real with everybody. So, you ready for your first homework assignment? I want you to think of the one or two, three people in your life that you have a high probability would love you the most. Who do you think in your life would love you the most? If they knew that you scratched somebody else's car and you didn't do anything about it, or, you know, you, you once cheated on your taxes, or... Whatever it is, whatever it is, right? Who are the people in your life that you could actually say that out loud to and you think they would love you right there? That's what I want. I want you to live a life where you actually can tell a greater truth so that you can go deeper into self-awareness. So that you can go deeper into yourself. Because whatever our stop point is, whatever our, the point is where we stop going deeper into ourselves, is because that's how much love we have. And if we want to go deeper, we need more love. You're willing to try? That's your homework. More love, more self-awareness. More love, more self-awareness. Lack of love, lack of self-awareness. Make sense? Pray with me. I invite you to open your mind, your heart, your soul to the activity of God that is right here, right now. 
And that what if tonight we let all the levels, all the facades, all the barriers, and what if we got to be loved just the way we are? Warts and all. What if we could be loved for the man or the woman we really are? In our greatness and in our weakness. In our light and in our dark. In our proudest moments and in our saddest moments. What if we could actually be loved right there? And what if being real was a requirement for feeling unconditionally loved? In the name and through the power of the living Christ, we take our next step into self-awareness and into love. And so it is. Amen.